Um, Lenin has always been an extremely controversial figure uh, in the world and are, are on the left. And I think it's probably true to say that there is no Marxist, no socialist, no revolutionary uh, for whom it has been so important to our rulers that they discredit them uh, uh, and that they attack them. He has uh, undoubtedly attracted more vilification, more character assassination and so on than uh, uh, any other figure, even, inc even including Trotsky. Trotsky got more from Stalin, but that's a different story. But for our rulers, Lenin has always been um, uh, enemy uh, number one. Now, there's no mystery uh, to that. Um, why that is the case. Uh, Trotsky, writing about uh, uh, Marx and Lenin, said, uh, in the end of the day, when you, you know, bear it down to its essentials, Karl Marx is the author of the Communist Manifesto uh, and Capital. Lenin is the author of the Russian Revolution. And the Russian Revolution represents the greatest victory for our class, for the working class in history, and the most mortal threat to uh, the bourgeoisie, to capitalism, that it has yet experienced. And the revolutionary wave that swept Europe uh, in the wake of the uh, Russian Revolution, the highest level of struggle, uh, the, uh, 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 and the moment when, the only moment probably in uh, the history of the working class movement, when you could actually say the international revolution was immediately possible. It was that, and it was identified with the politics of Lenin. And they, of course, therefore, uh, or wanted above all to discredit Lenin. And a whole historical narrative was developed uh, by the American state uh, through those universities and so on where they had a lot of influence. And they deployed uh, people who knew the history of the Russian labor movement, many of them ex-Mensheviks and so on, and whole teams of scholars, to produce a whole narrative to discredit Lenin and discredit the, the, the revolution. Um, I'm going to... I'll just say a word about that. It's not the main focus of what I want to talk about. But that, that narrative went as follows. Lenin was a would-be dictator from the beginning. Stalinism was, uh, with all its horrors, was the uh, logical outcome of what Lenin was about from the start. You can construct a story that uh, Lenin was, uh, look at the faction fights in the Russian Social Democratic Party where Lenin fought with a certain amount of vigour for his side, that proved he wanted to be the dictator of Russia. He wrote, what is to be done, in which he said, uh, you know, we must raise political consciousness. So that one shows you wanted to impose socialism on uh, the, the, the Russian working class. There was uh, a coup d'etat in uh, October 1917. It wasn't a workers' revolution. It was a coup carried out on Lenin's orders. That was their grab for power uh, 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 and so on. This whole story, which represents continuity. And there were endless books, which took this for granted. Um, this probably still is, and certainly was when, in the days when I was a student, absolutely what was, became known as the textbook version uh, on Lenin. If you didn't agree with that, it was probably just assumed that you didn't know anything much about it. And that view, by the way, was not confined to the right wing. That view was shared, more or less, with some deflections, by the mainstream of social democracy, who also wanted to discredit Lenin, and it was shared all the way through to uh, anarchists. I saw a video clip of no less a figure than Noam Chomsky outline that, more or less just as I've said it, as the view of Lenin. Uh, and, more or less, if you read what actually happened, that is the truth about Lenin. You know, if you think differently, it's because you're ignorant, uh, and so on. That, that, so, this is a very powerful um, uh, narrative. Now, I, I could spend, easily, and it would be good in a way, to spend these... Uh, 35 minutes refuting that. Um, I'm going to try and refute it in about five minutes, three or four minutes, because I've got a lot of other things I want to say. But I want to say that I do not think this fits the facts at all. Right? First off, I think it makes it psychological nonsense if you look at Lenin's life. Just the psychology is not really important, but psychologically it's silly. If you were in Russia in the 19th, late 19th century, 
And what motivated you was you wanted power, and you're from a reasonably uh, prosperous background and so on. Which choice would you take? All right? You could, you could, uh, you want to get power, you could join the Emancipation of Labour Group in 1893, you had about 30 members, uh, membership of which qualified you immediately for Siberia. You could go, you could devote the next 20 years to building an illegal organisation, right? You could get yourself actually sent to Siberia, you could, get that. You could go into exile, you could fight to defend illegal organisation at the height of reaction, you would do all this because you knew that there was going to be a world war and there would be a revolution and you were going to win that revolution and eventually you'd be dictator of Russia. <laughs> or you could join the Tsarist bureaucracy and get yourself a bit of real power. You know, so I don't think, I think psychologically it's absurd. You know, I mean, uh, we hope that the Socialist Workers' Party, I should say, I mean, I hope that the Socialist Workers' Party in Britain eventually uh, takes power and that uh, Charlie Kimber over there becomes General Secretary. Or but actually, if, you, if you're power mad, I don't recommend it. It's not a good choice right now. <laughs> you know, anyway. So psychologically, it makes no sense. Historically, it makes uh, uh, no sense. The Bolshevik Party was not... Lenin's uh, a toy. He was not a dictator in the Bolshevik. Anybody who reads the history of the Bolshevik Party was full of factional struggles, debates, and so on. Often on the most important questions, Lenin was outvoted. Even on the whole nature of the Russian Revolution, he, most of the Bolshevik leadership thought he was uh, a bit crazy in 1917. The only reason he won the debate uh, about going for workers' power and so on was because what he was saying was fitting with what the rank and file workers from the Vibor district to the Putilov works and so the big factory in Pittsburgh was saying and, uh, and so on. And there were many occasions when, uh, on crucial things, absolutely crucial things like uh, war or peace and the Brest Litov talks where Lenin found himself uh, uh, outvoted. So it, wasn't, it was very democratic, it wasn't uh, Lenin's dictatorship uh, at all. Um, the most important, though, is the fact that the reason that Stalinism developed uh, in Russia uh, 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 from a, uh, was nothing to do with the Bolshevik form of organisation. The reason Stalinism developed in Russia was first because the Russian Revolution failed to spread. It remained isolated. Secondly, because the Russian working class was so destroyed in the Civil War, which was a consequence of the revolution failing to spread. Uh, the Russian working class was so destroyed in, that, in the terrible conditions that it was unable to retain control of the state that it created in 1917. And these two facts, the isolation of the uh, revolution, the pressure of world capitalism on, on Russia, and the, uh, the, the decimation of the Russian working class led to the emergence of a bureaucracy, a new bureaucratic ruling class, who Stalin was the representative of. He didn't create them. In a way, they created Stalin. He went and worked back and moulded them and so on. But he did. individuals don't create social classes. Individuals are products of social classes. Individuals have an effect, but they're not the demiurge of history. That's what produced uh, um, Stalinism uh, in Russia, not... Leninist forms of organisation, still less Lenin's personality. And the, uh, if you then look as to why the Russian Revolution remained isolated, fundamentally it was because there wasn't Bolshevik type parties in Germany, in Italy, uh, in France, in Finland, in Hungary, and the rest of, of Europe. It was the absence of revolutionary parties, I would argue, that led to the isolation of the Russian Revolution, the failure of that revolutionary movement. So, um, so, uh, I would say that that whole narrative that was developed by um, uh, the, the bourgeoisie through its various academic supports and so on uh, is, uh, is, com is completely false. Um, I would say, therefore, that I would absolutely stand by and stand over the historical Lenin. Right? That does not mean that I think he was God, that he made no mistakes. That doesn't mean every single... Uh, letter he wrote or every single expression he used, etc., etc. No, but I stand by the main <coughs> politics 
and practice uh, uh, of learning, absolutely. And I think there is an immense uh, uh, amount uh, to learn from it. That doesn't mean we copy it exactly, not, not at all. Um, I, in Ireland, we would all say that how we stand by uh, James Connolly, uh, the great Irish socialist. This doesn't mean to say we think that we should go down and occupy the GPO next week. It does cross our mind time from time to time, but, uh, but uh, um, it does cross our mind from time to time, uh, but uh, usually wiser counsels prevail. Um, right. So, so, obviously, questions about the historical Lenin and what he did and what happened here and so on, and his tactics, all of which I think we learn from are extremely welcome, but it's not the main thing I want to talk about. Um, the main thing I want to talk about, I want to take as a starting point uh, a splendid book, uh, which I would strongly recommend to you, uh, by George Lukács, uh, called Lenin, A Study in the Unity of His Thought, which was written uh, just after Lenin died in 1924. It's a brilliant summary uh, of Lenin's main uh, political ideas, uh, and uh, um, it deals with things like, uh, you just look at the, the text, it deals with things like the actuality of the revolution, the leading role of the working class, the vanguard party of the proletariat, imperialism, world war and civil war, the state as weapon and so on. In other words, it, it deals with, more fully than I can in this talk, with a, a synthesis of Lenin's politics. But then if you turn to the postscript, which was written in 1967, in other words, were, was written 40 odd years afterwards, 40 years in which Lukács' politics had been essentially Stalinized and moderated, he then says, he then criticizes his own book uh, and says, look, that was written in the 20s. Those debates only apply to the 20s. They're of no relevance today. This is in 1968. Nobody, you know, he said, I wrote then that historical materialism is a theory of proletarian revolution. No doubt that had an element of truth, but it's not the main thing, and so on. And then he says what we really should value in Lenin is Lenin's personality and, his, uh, and uh, Lenin as an exemplar, uh, what he calls him here, uh, as Lenin's an ir ineradicable value, a new form of exemplary attitude to reality. Now, uh, um, there's quite a lot of literature along those lines. I quote Lukács, the best of them. But who, for whom Lenin... Lenin can be made to serve any political purpose because what you're really doing is being a, a Lenin personality. You can, you can, you're seizing the moment. You're making a strategic intervention. From this point of view, Slavoj Žižek is an exemplary Leninist. Uh, you know, Lenin organised the... Uh, uh, or politically didn't actually organise it, but Lenin has responsibility for the October Revolution, but you made a strategic intervention at the Historical Materialism Conference. It's Leninism and so on. You know, does that for you of Lenin? I'm not interested in that. Um, I have to say I'm well aware that I am not Lenin, um, that most of us are not Lenin, uh, we can't be, we're not in those historical circumstances, but maybe, just maybe, we can be Leninists if what we can identify are the core principles of Lenin's politics and fight for those today, on condition, of course, that they remain relevant uh, and true. So that's the main thing I want to, to, to speak about. What are those core principles? Now, I haven't got time for them all, so I'm going to choose two, the two most important and the two most uh, 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 relevant. Uh, those two are, I want to suggest, Lenin's theory of the state and the practical conclusions that he drew from that, and the second is the question of the party. Let's start with the, 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 the question of the state. Why do I say this is core, this is central? Well, you could look as to when Lenin wrote his main work on the subject, The State and Revolution, and the circumstances in which he published it. Right? The State and Revolution, it was based on notes that Lenin made, studies that he made uh, uh, during the First World War, because of the betrayals of social democracy which supported the war, he went back to the foundations of Marxism, and so on, and that included looking at the Marxist theory of the state, which he thought was of exceptional importance. And then he rushes out his book, his greatest work, um, the, the, the State and Revolution. He rushes it out in August 1917. 
Now, think about it. He had a few things to be doing in August 1917, but he considered it worthwhile to publish this book. He ends the book saying, well, I had to stop writing it because there was an actual revolution occurring, <laughs> and that, you know, the actual insurrection, so I had to stop. Uh, but it does tell you he thought it was rather important. And if you look at the Russian Revolution itself, right, what was its central slogan? Its central slogan is all power to the Soviets. Bread, land and peace, how do you get them? All power to the Soviets. What is the Russian Revolution the story of? It's the story of the taking of power by the Soviets, by workers' councils. What is the message that goes out to the um, rest of the world through the Communist International, through the appeal of the Russian Revolution? It is Soviet power. Workers' power. This is how the working class can take power. That is the central message of, of, on which working people right across the world, around the world, rally to uh, uh, the, uh, the Russian Revolution. And they're quite right. I mean, even in Ireland, uh, we had a limerick Soviet set up uh, uh, in Ireland, a whole various Soviets and so on. I think you had them in Wales and so on. People, because they probably weren't quite like the Petrograd Soviet, <laughs> but the idea was there. You know, Gramsci writes Soviets in Italy and so on. This is central to the Russian Revolution and to, to, to Lenin. And what does he say in the State and Revolution? He begins the, the book with a reconstitution, a summary, a pretty thorough summary, of all the main things that Marx and Engels said on the question of the state, of the class nature of the state, how the state, it's not just that it's biased towards the ruling class, it is biased towards the ruling class, of course, but it's an instrument of ruling class power, and it is a weapon uh, that the, uh, the ruling class uses, Lukács understood that very well in 1924 when he called the state as weapon. Uh, and, uh, but it is a product of the division of society into classes. Not an eternal category. have always been states. States arise with the division of society into classes uh, right, because of the irreconcilable conflict of interest between them. Therefore, a body has to emerge over and above society which represses, holds down the oppressed class and maintains normal order in difficult zones. That state is uh, controlled essentially uh, by uh, the dominant economic class. And so, so we live under a, a capitalist state. Uh, uh, Lenin goes through all that and then he comes to a key point, the point he emphasises most. What is this key point? The key point, he says, is contained in the lesson that Marx learned from the Paris Commune that Marx learned from the last great previous revolutionary struggle of the workers when, where, when workers took power, and which he said was, Marx thought was so important that he actually makes the point of amending the Communist Manifesto on this. What is that key point? He says that it is not possible for the working class to take over the ready-made state machinery from the bourgeoisie and wield it for its own purposes. And he says, this is... Crucial insight. Instead, the working class has to smash, destroy, dismantle, doesn't matter what you say, but has to abolish and dismantle the existing capitalist state and create a, a, a state of its own, a worker's uh, a, a worker state, which, of course, it was in the process of doing in Russia through the workers' councils and so on. The workers' councils... You know, you see the link with uh, all, all power uh, to, to, to the Soviets. And he goes on to say that uh, you know, this point, this central point in the Marxist theory of the state that Marx learned from the Paris Commune had been glossed over, hidden, obscured by the social democratic movement, the so-called Marxists, Karl Kautsky and the rest of them, uh, for, for the last 30 years. Uh, 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 and so, and that is the the, the fundamental uh, point. Now, the uh, the question uh, uh, then uh, 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 arises: Is this true today? Now, there is a whole body of um, I, I have not time to go through innumerable theories that suggest it's wrong, right? They go from, uh, I remember back to the days when I was a student, when the dominant theory was what would be called bourgeois pluralism, 
There is no central state. There's lots of competing interests and lots of different interest groups, and nobody has power, uh, etc., which uh, is provided. You know, you have a media elite, and you have a political elite, and you have a judicial elite, and you have a military elite. You're just not supposed to notice they all come from the same class. <laughs> you know, they're all competing elites, and they cancel one another. Then there's an infinitely more sophisticated and clever critique from Michel Foucault, which says that... Uh, going to be unfair to Foucault for reasons of time here, but it says power is everywhere. There is power in the office, power in the school, power, uh, 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 power in the local council, power in this room. I'm very powerful in this room because I've got the microphone and so on. There's power everywhere. Everywhere you go, there's power. And there's always a struggle of the powerless against the powerful. It goes on forever, uh, uh, etc. And, and if the powerless, replace the powerful, and so on. You know, uh, that, that will continue anyway. And it's wrong to see power as just located in the state. Now, uh, I just want to, to say about that two, two things. One, it was never the Marxist view that power was just located in the state. This is absurd. But what about economic power that Marx spent so much time uh, analysing? So it, what the point is to under, understand... Not that power does exist in the office and everywhere else, but what is the structure of power? What is it that produces the power in the office? It's not human nature that produces the power in the office. What produces the power in the office is that the power in the office is a derivative of capitalist relations in the society as a whole. And the second point is this, that it may well be that you hate your office manager and he's a bastard, but he's not the czar. He's not David Cameron. He's not the American state. And, he's, you know, and he is not capable of imposing a military dictatorship like al-Sisi in, uh, in Egypt and crushing the whole working class. You know, so there's a sense of proportion here that is, that is rather I important uh, 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 in all this. Misses the point, in other words. Um, there's another critique which is as associated with um, Antonio Gramsci, and Nikos Palantzis. Where Gramsci is concerned, separate meeting on this, people hear that Gramsci emphasised hegemony. Uh, hegemony, Gramsci said, was a combination of force and consent. The ruling class rules by the combination of force and uh, ideological power, getting people to, uh, to agree with it. Gramsci did indeed say this, but the people who hear it and use it just forget about the force bit. What they hear is, it's ideological hegemony. And so we're going to defeat it with an ideological counter-hegemony and ignore what Gramsci was very well aware of, twist Gramsci, lose the element of, uh, of, of the, the force and struggle, which Gramsci had himself been involved in. And, of course, it was the element of force that put Gramsci in the prison when he was writing the prison uh, uh, notebooks and so on. So in the case of Gramsci, it's a misrepresentation of Gramsci. In the case of Poulantzis, who is hugely influential in Greece, for example, in Syriza, uh, it's not a misrepresentation. What Poulantzis argues is that the Leninist view is too mechanical. The state can't just be seen as an instrument of class power. The state should be seen as a condensation of class forces. Right. Uh, as a set of relations. Now, you write this on the page, it sounds clever, doesn't it? It's much cleverer to say it's a condensation of class forces than it is to say that it's an instrument of ruling class power. Uh, right, it's much more appealing in, the, in, a, in a university or whatever. But what does it actually mean? Right? Yes, it's a condensation of class forces, OK, but it's actually a condensation of class forces that produces an instrument that the ruling class can smash the working class with. You know, I mean, it doesn't... Now, the point I want to make about all this and its relevance today... Whether you go for Foucault or Gramsci in its Eurocommunist form or Pilatus or whatever, what does it actually amount to as a political strategy? And you can see it with Syriza, you can see it with Podemos, you can see it with all the Eurocommunists. What it actually amounts to as a political strategy is that you try to win a parliamentary majority by whatever means necessary. You try to win the parliamentary majority for the left and then you believe you can take over and transform the existing state. Now, again, put it in words. We're going to transform the state, not smash it. Fine, except 
What state are we talking about? Would we be, for example, talking about the British state? So you are going to win an election, and this is going to enable you to transform the British armed forces, led by generals who see themselves as heirs to Marlborough, Wellington, uh, Nelson, Montgomery, with a history of 500 years of rule. You're going to become the, the prime minister. Jeremy Corbyn is going to be prime minister, and they'll take their orders from him. Right? You're going to transform the British judiciary and the British police force. You're going to take the Metropolitan Police, fresh from murdering Mark Duggan and Jean-Charles de Menezes and all the other people they've killed and so on, and they're going to take their orders from Jeremy Corbyn. You know, once you put it concretely, maybe that's the British state, they're particularly horrible. The American state, how about that? Right, you're going, you're going to elect a black prime minister and then the LAPD and the NYPD are going to take their orders from him and stop murdering black people. You're going to transform the Pentagon and the CIA and the FBI. They're going to start doing the bidding of Bernie Sanders, the left Social Democrat, if he is elected. Come on. Once you pose it concretely, instead of the kind of highfalutin language of uh, the university, it, it turns, what it turns out to be is the old strategy of reformism, the strategy that Lenin was uh, arguing against. So I want to say that the... Leninist theory of the state not only was central and was true, but is true uh, today. Really. It doesn't, that doesn't, so I haven't got time for all, all things, it doesn't exclude participating in parliamentary elections uh, or, uh, and all of that, as Lenin also explained. But it does mean, um, a quote from Lenin here, this is from left wing communism, He's, uh, he says, uh, uh, only workers' Soviets and not Parliament can be the instrument whereby the aims of the proletariat will be achieved. Those who have failed to understand this up to now are inveterate reactionaries, even if they are the most highly educated people, most experienced politicians, most sincere socialists, most erudite Marxists, and most honest citizens and family men. <laughs> it's fairly clear. Okay. <laughs> right, second question. Time short, so... Second, a second question, the, the question of the party. And it's very, very closely linked because what the project is shapes what the, 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 the party is. Right. The argument that the question of the party, the revolutionary party, is absolutely central to Lenin does not rest on the book. It rests on the simple fact that this is what he devoted his entire political life to doing, building, defending and fighting for the party, and having succeeded in doing it in Russia... Uh, and built a revolutionary party that carried through a revolution in Russia, he proposed then to spread uh, uh, this idea to the rest of the world and organise a communist international. So that this was central to what he was doing is uh, uh, in dispute. Uh, not in dispute, not disputable. Right, now, the way in which this is often talked about is in terms of there's a model. You will hear this, there's the Leninist model. Right? And then ask yourself this, what, in what book of Lenin's? He had a model, what book or article would you find this model? You don't. What you find in Lenin is continuously, throughout his political life, arguments about what the party should do. Right? Uh, it has to take up all questions of oppression, he argues, in what is to be done. It can't just wage the economic struggle, for example. It needs a newspaper. Uh, in other sense, it should participate in elections. Uh, in left-wing communism, it has to also work in the trade unions, even if the trade unions have right-wing and reactionary leaders and so on. It has to do all sorts of arguments about what the party should do in various circumstances. A, and a model, no. Uh, right. And very sensibly so. Because actually pursuing uh, this goal in different circumstances, you can't do it with... Uh, 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 a model. But you do find a common thread. And the common thread runs right the way through to his early factional struggles with what were called the economists, the people who said the, work, the socialists should only pursue the economic struggle of the working class, and who he identified, he linked to German reformist Bernstein, through to when he's arguing with them, debating with the Mensheviks, through to when he's arguing about what kind of party they should have. 
and absolutely crucial after 1914 when the Social Democrats sell out and he wants to break to form a third international. Uh, uh, and crucial through in the Communist International when he writes 21 conditions uh, for, for who can be a member of the Com Communist International. And that is that by a revolutionary party, he means and wants a party of revolutionaries, not a party in which the revolutionaries are in coalition with the reformists. It's a simple point, uh, 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 right? But it is fundamental. He wants a party that is committed to the revolution, yep, committed to the revolution, not with a reformist wing. And he keeps insisting on this with all the European Communist parties, some of whom are reluctant to break with the reformists. Uh, right. It doesn't mean you don't work with reformists. He's, letting, you know, he's all for the United Front uh, 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 on, uh, or, all, all the time, or all, in many circumstances and so on. Doesn't mean you don't work with the, re the reformists, but you have to have an independent revolutionary pol political organisation. You do not uh, merge with them. Why? Why is this so important? Two fundamental reasons. First reason is because the development, when we look at the development of class consciousness uh, and political awareness among working people, it's always uneven. Right? Even in mass struggles, there are always those who are more advanced and those who are less advanced. And the less advanced are influenced by, in many cases, outright bourgeois and reactionary ideas, racist ideas, sexist ideas, and so on. But particularly, they are influenced by bourgeois ideas reflected through reformism. For example, that the state is neutral, that we can take over the state, that we should operate within the framework of the state, that we should respect the police, that we should respect the law, all those sorts of ideas uh, there, uh, that there's a national interest and so on. All those sorts of ideas are there in the, mind, uh, in the minds of working class people, even in revolt, while they may also be being defiant and standing up and saying Austria and all those sorts of things. And on that basis, the reformists can build and do build politically. And the historical experience is that the reformists basing themselves on that contradiction in working class thought, will betray the revolution, will turn against the revolution, will mislead the revolution, or will maintain a passive attitude that will enable the uh, right and reaction to, to, to triumph, as did you know, Mussolini in uh, Italy as a result of the Italian Socialist Party behaving like this, or as did... Uh, uh, um, uh, Pinochet in Chile as a result of Allende and that project. Uh, uh, and so we can give many uh, historical uh, examples of this. And Lenin thought that if you had such people organised within the party, or you were in the same party as those people who had political independence from, your party would be paralysed at exactly the moment when it needs to take decisive action uh, 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 in the revolution. Uh, the last thing you want, they had a bit of an argument about it, but the last thing you want in October 1917 is to be saying, well, there's one third of the party wants an insurrection, and there's two thirds of the party want reform. You're, you're not going to be able to do the insurrection if, they, uh, if that's the, the, the state you're. So it's, it's absolutely connected, the question of the party, therefore, is absolutely uh, connected to, to the, uh, um, the, the, the question of, of, of the state. Um, now, um, is this out of date? One of the things I would say to people, I hear people often say, oh, that was 50 years ago, 100 years ago. You know, uh, we've got, times have moved on. These things are, uh, you know, we need a, uh, yes, okay. Uh, we need to move on. Hang on a minute. You can't judge the truth or otherwise of ideas by, you know, how long it is. You know, I could imagine, well, I'm sure they do, the creation of Darwin. 100 years ago. Come on, let's have a new theory. <laughs> you, you know, the law of gravity, 500. No, you can't do it like that. You have to say, is it still true? Right? Now, is it true that in the fundamental determinants of the revolutionary theory, Lenin's revolutionary theory of the revolutionary party have changed? Have they changed? Is it the case now that when the working class radicalises, for example, in Greece, for example, in Egypt, for example, we've had it in Ireland, that 
everybody becomes a revolutionary socialist all at once. No. Is it the case that reformism is still a problem? Yes. Is it the case that the new reformists will not sell out the revolution? The new reformists will carry the revolution through. Well, there's people who have this hope from Alexis Tsipras and Julio Iglesias and so on. You know, we shall see. We shall see. Actually, my, I think what happens... Uh, it's not just a question of they sell out. What happens is that the counter-pressure means that you get lowering and lowering of expectation. Alex Tsipras' problem is not is he going to overthrow Greek capitalism. He isn't even trying to do that. Alex Tsipras' problem is will he be forced into implementing austerity or can he maintain some resistance against it thanks to the struggle of the Greek people. But, uh, I mean, that's, a, that's another big debate we'll be talking about. Yes, OK, we'll be talking about all uh, Marxism. But has reformism, in all its different forms, changed its spots? No, it hasn't. And therefore, unless you build a revolutionary party, which is built to lead the process of the working class emancipating itself through smashing the state and creating the working class, unless you do that, the revolution won't succeed. Those ideas, I believe, absolutely relevant uh, to today. And so I think it's very simple. And I really will sum up with my <laughs> last sense here. I don't think there's any great mystery about being a Leninist today and what it means. I think it means you build a revolutionary party, right? you take that seriously, you fight for that in every, everywhere uh, to build that with a serious relationship to the working class, and you do that with the perspective not of reforming the state, not of taking it over just through a parliamentary majority, but of smashing the state uh, perspective of the working class emancipating itself be taking power through worker, uh, or, or workers' councils. Sometimes people say, oh, that language is frightening and it's, it puts people off. You can put all of that language very simply in terms of the struggles of the people. It's not the language that I'm concerned about. It's whether you do it uh, or, or not. In Ireland, we say people power. People know what we mean. But, uh, uh, but that, that you can put it in the language of the day, but are you pursuing those aims? That's being a Leninist today. Hi there. Um, I'm Rabia from the SWP in Glasgow. Um, I just have a question. Uh, I read a book um, a number of years ago about Lenin and building the party. I think that's what the title of the book was. And um, he speaks about um, how peasants in Russia, and, and I think around about um, before the First Revolution in 1906, um, they had to be transformed or they had to jail, um, the, the, um, get the, uh, those peasants to um, develop because of the working class was not a big working class at that time. So... What I want to know is um, how did um, the transformation take place, the, the workers leading, the peasants leading in a revolution, and also how does that compare to, for example, Leninism today when we have emerging economies like India, for example, do, does a working class, um, and, and what, um, idea, I, what type of ideas do we use to influence a working class in India to um, transform and lead a revolution? Thank you. I want to say something briefly about Greece because I think that's where the argument is most concentrated at the moment, both the question of the state and the question of revolutionary organisation. First of all, on the question of the state, if you think about what uh, Tsipras and Syriza represent, what they are trying to do, despite the language which sounds very radical at times, is a compromise with the system. So that already before the election, they were talking not about cancelling the debt as a whole, but only part of it. And that already reflected the notion that you weren't going to try and have a frontal assault on the system. Not the question of revolution, John is absolutely right about that, but the simple question of are you going to end austerity or not, you, you took the bet that you'd do a deal with the state and with the European Union, by the way, that you could try and make a difference. I think the reality of Schäuble and the rest of us proves that's not possible, and therefore it comes back to the question of what the class itself is doing. And that's very important, because sometimes there's an inversion of this. Sometimes I think, oh, it's Tsipras leading the movement. On the contrary, it's actually the pressure of the class that has made Tsipras possible. It's the pressure of ordinary workers, millions of workers in Greece, arguing and pushing for, against austerity that made it possible for Tsipras in the first place. Think now about, briefly about the referendum of last week. That was brilliant. 
think about there was two, way, two different aspects of that. The first was what Tsipras wanted out of the referendum, which was the more authority to renegotiate, a hiding to nothing, as it's now beginning to prove, not for the people in the referendum itself. Now, what would revolutionaries do in that sense? Very small numbers who actually vote for the revolutionary left in Greece, but actually quite influential in all kinds of ways when it comes to fighting fascism, when it comes to the big, big arguments and the big disputes going on in the Greek working class. What did they do? They didn't stand aside, as some on the left did, the Communist Party in Greece, say, who cares, because after all, it's a choice between either the EU or Tsipras's concession. They said, no, the feeling about people is that we want to know, we want to deepen that no. That's where you have to be both absolutely clear, have your clarity of your politics, the kind of thing that John is talking about, but at the same time, you always intervene where the class is to try and build a, prop, a, be, a better resistance. Now I think we can say, whatever Tsipras comes up with by way of a rotten deal, the argument doesn't stop there. The fight will continue, and I think the revolutionary left has much deepened its roots inside the Greek working class, and that will mean that the question of whether or not uh, austerity continues, now comes down much more to the question of what the class is prepared to do. That, I think, is what will face all of us in terms of uh, this way the struggle will deepen. It may yet be feel a bit distant at the moment, but that ultimately is what we have to be clear about. And that's why, if you want to have not just a revolution, but simply resistance to austerity at its strongest, you have to build a revolutionary party. Okay, I, I'm, I'm Choi Ilbung. Um from South Korea, I'm a, a member of uh, uh, Worker Soli Solidarity, uh, a South Korea sister organization of the SWP. Uh, I just want to uh, talk about just the three points uh, related, I think, to, to the uh, Lenin's ideas of Revolutionary Socialist Party. One is uh, we have to be organized, we have to organize ourselves in a very tight and uh, disciplined way in the uh, trade union shop floor, uh, a, a socialist can be a, a good, you know, a good a trade unionist and also a good uh, a propagandist and even an agitator and a good the socialist paper seller on the street. Uh, but uh, this is uh, uh, what uh, the classical syndicalist did one century one century ago. We have to be organized in a, a uh, caucus, you know, a party cell, in a, a, a kind of fraction a, within the uh, workplace and campuses as, because uh, the, at the time of dispute, the situation is quite, you know, changing day by day and the uh, management and, and reformists are quite uh, um, uh, uh, doing uh, maneuvering, uh, thinking about maneuvering. So we have to uh, talk, about, talk about the tactics and operations uh, every day. So we have to very uh, coherent uh, organization within the party, within the workplace. And, and second, uh, we, have to, uh, be, uh, we have to be against the uh, uh, tail, tailism which means uh, tail-ending the, the average ideas of the working class. A, a, at the time of, especially at the time of dispute, every worker seems to be fighting, so uh, it is very, very easy. One Sorry. One minute. No, no, one minute. One minute. Okay. okay. Uh, it's very easy to be uh, tail-ending the, uh, uh, the, the whole mood of the working class, but the, uh, this mood can be very uh, uh, vulnerable to the reformist maneuvering. Third thing is uh, we have to be tactically flexible. For instance, we, we uh, uh, can make a united, kind of a united front, all front, within the uh, trade union. For instance, in Korea, uh, in, in spring, the uh, civil union was on the front of, uh, I mean, uh, and the front of the uh, KCTU struggle, I mean, they had to defend the civil servant pension, but the union leadership was too moderate, so uh, they were very vacillating. So in this case, we, our organization, uh, uh, proposed to uh, uh, form a, a network to defend the uh, civil servant pension to the nail, and uh, this uh, served as a kind of our own united front or uh, I mean, our own front or united front. It was very useful in order to be to intervene in the tra in trade union uh, delegate conferences and so on and so forth. So, 
uh, we can we have to be organized in a Leninist way, Leninist way, in the uh, trade union shop floor <laughs> and campus. I know about you. Yes. Yes, Steve Sparks, uh, RS21. Uh, first of all, I better start off by saying that I agree 100% that you need a revolutionary, you need a revolutionary party. But um, uh, I think the problem is, in recent recent years, is that there's there's been a like a revisionism of what uh, Lenin actually. Um, actually said, and um, uh, in the um, International Socialist Journal last year, there was an article by Core and, and Jenkins on um, Lenin in answer to somebody called, um, some intellectual called Lee, I think his name was, and um, uh, it wasn't 100% clear what this Lee guy was saying to me, but... Um, uh, basically seemed to be arguing that uh, Lenin was a bit of a bully, really. And um, in, in, answer, in answer to this, um, Cor and Jenkins were, um, were defending Lenin, which is good, a good start. But uh, the problem, problem comes where they argue that... Uh, um, when there was the famous Finland station bit, when, uh, Revol when uh, Lenin came back to the, uh, uh, the, the revolution in the, in, the, in the April period, that um, uh, they, they argued that there was mutual misunderstandings and time in the part, there was a, a general agreement to protect the revolution, respond to national crisis, carry out the basic programme of the revolution. And this has got no, no actual reality uh, in, in, in what actually happened. What actually happened was that Lenin came back and the, the whole party uh, basically said, you're a nutter, and he, he, he produced the uh, April, April thesis saying that we've got to... Um, no bread, no peace, no land. What fucking revolution? And um, the, in, nobody supported him. Nobody in the uh, Central Committee, nobody in the party leadership um, support, supported him. He, he, he had nobody putting their name to his article um, on the April thesis. And uh, it took a month of argument, a month of him looking towards the radical workers to push the party to a position that they had to take power Finish off, please. In, 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 in October. And so without Lenin, there would not be a revolution. We have to get this, we have to get this idea in our heads that Finish, please. the leadership is not everything. It's about you learn from the working, working class. And that, that is the lesson now, please, in terms of uh, uh, the sparks and the uh, um, electricians, um, rank-and-file workers. We have to learn from the workers. Uh, I'm building a revolutionary organisation together with my uh, friends and comrades in Poland at the moment, so I don't want to really take up that RS21 thing, except to say that looking from outside, it seems, frankly, ridiculous that... Uh, there was a young Polish guy who came over from Britain to, to Poland, and I was speaking with him. He, he was with the RS21 people, and he said that, well, you know, Tr Trotsky had a separate organization to Lenin. You know, the people have separate organizations. It's a good thing. And I said to him that Trotsky actually said that the biggest mistake of his life was that he wasn't with Lenin before the Russian Revolution. The biggest well, he was just before the Russian, you know, in the middle of the re revolution, he, he joined. So, I, you know, for revolutionaries, all right, we don't make a fetish out of organization, but if there is already revolutionary ideas and a revolutionary organization, it's silly to make clones of that organization, which only goes to weaken us. But that's actually not what I wanted to say. It's 35 years since the, the beginning of the Solidarity Movement in, in August. Um, 
and uh, the, the big solidarity movement in Poland that began in, uh, in, in the shipyards. Now, there was a, if you remember that time, there was this big negotiating table when they signed the first agreement with the government. The government had to back down. And there was a table like this. You know, let's say John Molyneux's left for Wenser. Sorry, John, but just for the sake of argument. To his left was a massive statue, two meters high, of Lenin. Lenin, this was a historic event one of the biggest workers' movements of the 20th century, or in history, a huge thing. Uh, members of the army wanted to join it. Members of the police didn't want to join it. I don't have time to go through the whole politics of the thing. But the point is, the symbol of the, of the, of the state capitalists, the symbol of the government, the symbol of, of the ruling class, was Lenin. And so what, what, what I want to get to now is that, that that seems like an insurmountable barrier, but it isn't because all the time the, the key principle of Leninism is that workers emancipate themselves and that you need a revolutionary organization. And all the time you're getting examples of how workers, even in a small scale where, the lo where there is a low level of struggle like in Poland at the moment, recently nurses struck in one place and they forced the government minister who said a day earlier that he would sack striking nurses because it's a disgrace for nurses to strike. He was forced to go down to them. They won a wage increase and they won reinstatement of, of, uh, of striking nurses. The point is that all the time, the, our, our arguments are backed up, like Thank yesterday, by, by the underground workers, by what workers are doing. And all we really are saying is that that is the source of our power. That is the source of social change. That's really Leninism in a nutshell. And the, it's, the, the tragedy in Poland was that the person in history who Finish did off, the please. most to popularize the slogan, all power to the Soviets, the one person in history, Lenin, who did that, was used as a working class symbol. It's like as if Ma Margaret Thatcher used Lenin uh, as her symbol. But that's not insurmountable. And if you join the Revolutionary Party here, and in other countries, you will help other countries also to build a revolutionary organization. So the, the, the question is urgent. It's not just an, an academic argument. It's an urgency. Uh, I'm Charlie Kimber, John's putative dictator. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I want to talk about leadership, but then I would, I suppose. Um, I want to speak about leadership at three levels, because I think leadership is a very unpopular term. Uh, the idea inside social movements and inside politics we need leadership is one that, for quite understandable reasons, is rejected by lots of people. Uh, because they think it means the issuance of orders from above, not listening or learning from workers' struggles, and a lack of democracy. Uh, I want to argue it's completely the opposite of that in three terms. The, in many ways, the most important bit of leadership is the leadership which is delivered not from uh, the top of a political organisation, but by its members on the ground in every workplace, in every community, and in every campaign. And this is very high premium on this at the moment. Uh, in every workplace in Britain, uh, there's an argument about racism, for example. Who is to blame for the problems in society? Uh, is it capitalist crisis? Is it Cameron? Is it the bosses and the bankers and so on? Or is it migration? Uh, the person who stands up in front of her workers and says, uh, I blame the bosses and the bankers, I don't blame migrants, is a leader in her workplace. Uh, that's the reality about what we mean by leadership. It's the person who is able to conduct an argument with the people around them. It's not being someone who issues orders. It's about someone who gives a lead to those around them in a way that prevents bourgeois ideas dominating, breaks the cosy austerity consensus, and opens up the possibilities of new forms of unity. The second form of leadership, and it links to the question Rabia asked of the first uh, person who spoke, is that Lenin understood the way that the working class, a tiny minority in Russian society, could nevertheless ally with and give leadership to much wider layers of non-proletarians, so that the Russian Revolution was carried through by an alliance of the working class and peasantry, because only the victory of the working class could guarantee land to the peasants. This is a very, very important understanding. Uh, because in the modern world, there are hundreds of millions of non-proletarians 
in Latin America, in Africa, in Asia, and so on, who nonetheless have to be pulled behind a revolutionary process led by the working class. Uh, this is an understanding of how uh, organizing, organized workers can give leadership to other groups and classes in society, and by doing so can enable the overthrow of the old regimes and carry through a socialist transformation. The third element it matters is that there are points in history which will not allow our side to avoid an argument, to not carry through an argument, and not put forward crucial moments of where there are decisions to be made. Such a thing is happening in Greece at the moment. Will the left in Syriza break uh, from supporting the austerity plan that's put forward? Finish will the working it. class be able to rely on strikes and struggles from below, or will it give in to simply allowing Syriza and Cyprus to carry through the austerity program? The question of historical moments cannot be avoided or postponed, and neither can the organisation of a party of leaders of all the different levels. That cannot be avoided and is the historical necessity. Yes. Yeah, uh, I think Lenin is, is probably the, the most uh, controversial revolutionary figure of the 20th century. And it's not simply the right who attack him, but also the left. I think in, within the anti, anti, what, what I would call the anti-capitalist left, uh, those who look to you know, Lenin's example are probably a very, very small minority. And I think this leads to lots of problems. And I, you know, from my experiences of working with the Occupy movement, uh, the question of leadership always arises. Uh, simply claiming that you're a horizontal organization doesn't solve the problem of organization and actually hides the question of leadership. And so you have these situations occurring repeatedly where you know, people come into revolt, resi resist against the system, and then the, often the question of organization arise, arises, and then the question of, well, what sort of organization do we need? Well, it's always the default is we need a, some kind of horizontal organization where everyone has an equal say. But in reality, that's not the way it works, because within all organization, there is always leadership. And unless that leadership is open and uh, visible, then it's not accountable. And what you have is a very undemocratic form of leadership occurring in very many social movements. And so up, my point is, is a question of leadership is, 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 a, is an important question, and it's one that every revolutionary has to deal with. But, you know, there's also a question of leadership within revolutionary organizations. And the, the other big problem we face is a lot of organizations in the past that have claimed to be Leninists, which have given, you know, the idea of Lenin... Uh, you know, the, the example of Lenin has become a, Sum up. a taboo. You know, it's, it's become a bad Finish word. Off, please. And so the, the, I think it would be really profitable if people actually started reading Lenin and actually understanding what he said rather than what other people say about him. I'm really sorry to everybody. I know there's loads of people who wanted to speak. Um, yeah, thank you. I'm Esme from Waltham Forest. Um, Steve said earlier that he thought Lars Lee had argued that Lenin was a bit of a bully. So it was really just to say that isn't what Lars Lee was arguing about Lenin. Lars Lee actually, who's a, a, a very clever scholar in the works of Lenin, argued that against the authoritarian stereotypes of Lenin and picks them apart very usefully. The problem with Lars Lee is he then goes on to say that actually there's nothing particularly unique or original to find in Lenin. And this is where Lars Lee falls down because actually the theory of the, the party and the state and you could say imperialism, there are a whole number of areas in which um, Lenin is very innovative and takes our theory and understanding and practice forward, but particularly in the question of the party. And I always think that Lenin's theory of the party should be understood not as a theory of the party, but always as a theory of the party and class. Because for Lenin, it was never about creating the best organised, most excellently self-contained party. It was always about having a party that interacted, made decisions, argued with the rest of the class, learned from the class, but fought with people in every struggle about how to take things forwards. And I think one of the key things you take from Lenin is the absolute principled nature of his position on the self-emancipation of working class, against all oppression, on internationalism, but then flexibility and everything else. And that's what makes life exciting for us politically today. It's it's an art form. It's not something you can read the formulas in Lenin from. You can get a method from Lenin, and then you have to apply it to the real world in which we live and make mistakes and learn from those mistakes 
and all the time sit back and rethink what you're trying to do. It's an art form as well as a science, and that's what makes it quite exciting, being a revolutionary in the modern world. Thank you, John. Okay, thank you. Um, right, the, the first question about the uh, working class and the peasantry. Um, I mean, I just say that there's huge amounts in Lenin that I didn't say anything. I was still knew I'd end up going over my time. Uh, I didn't say anything about Lenin's theory of imperialism. Um, there's other meetings on it. Alex Kalinikos is speaking on imperialism and so on. So I didn't say anything about it. Cru- crucially important. Um, and for Lenin, the question of the relationship with the peasantry was always of tremendous importance. He wrote probably about six books on the subject in one way or, way or another. Um, because, of course, Russia was overwhelmingly a peasant country. Uh, the working class was a small minority. The main force on what you would call the left in uh, Russia, uh, what people say would call the, the, the main force on the left, were who called themselves the SRs, the Socialist Revolutionaries. Names are confusing in history, aren't they? Um, you know, these people turn out not to be revolutionary socialists at all, but they called themselves the Socialist Revolutionaries, were based on the peasants. Uh, and the, most of the uh, Russian left, they use that, uh, that terminology, looked to the peasants, uh, etc. Then there were others, the Social Democrats, who turned out to be the revolutionary Marxists, distinguished themselves. No, they said the working class is the socialist class. They were Marxists. They understood the working class, not the peasants. But then that raised the question of what is the relationship between the working class uh, 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 and the peasants. It is, of course, fundamental to Marxism that it is the proletariat, the working class, that is the agent of socialist change. If it were the peasants, you could have had socialist revolution at any time in the last thousand years, uh, uh, and so on. But the peasants are, are their Conditions of life do not enable them to defeat um, the centralised power of capital uh, 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 and so on, which is based in the cities. The conditions of the working class do. But that, they, what is the relationship between the working class and the peasantry? And Lenin spent a good deal of his political uh, uh, activity arguing that there absolutely needs to be an alliance between the working class and the peasants. Right. The working class has to defend and support the rights of the peasants. I haven't got time to go into the, the whole thing, but that's the, uh, the essence. And support the struggle in Russia, the peasants uh, for land. Now, how, is this important today? Yes, it is important uh, uh, today for a, a, a number of reasons. What a, a huge gain for us, for the revolution and for socialism, is the fact that proletarianisation, urbanisation, the working class today is infinitely larger than it was uh, in Russia in 1917 on the world scale. Just look at China. How many Chi- and I don't know any accurate figure of the number of workers there are in China, but probably 500 million, 600 million workers uh, in China. The power, if they move in response to the crisis of Chinese capitalism and so on, they're already combative, they will rock the world. But does... So that's tremendous advantage, the fact that working class is like. But that doesn't mean to say the question of the peasants are not important. If you look at what happened in the Egyptian revolution, you will find that you know, it was really important that the revolutionaries of Tahrir Square, you had to have an argument, they had to support demands that related to the peasants. One of the jobs of a revolutionary party is to be the memory of the class and to learn from previous experience. Imagine you're a young revolutionary in Egypt you bring down Mubarak by struggle in Tahrir Square and the Battle of the Camel and these enormous struggles uh, on, the, on the streets of, of Cairo, Alexandria and so on. You're going to think, my God, we can change the world just by going into the street and fighting the police and we can win. That's what you need to do. Well, it, they, that was magnificent. But what about the peasants in the villages? Do you need a majority? The Revolutionary Party... One of its jobs is to know that these questions are not coming up for the first time in uh, you know, 2011. There's a history, and we can learn from that history. And we learn, uh, Stephen was quite right about learning from the working class. We learn from the working class, not just today, but from the past and the struggles from the past and so on. The Revolutionary Party does that, and therefore you need to relate to the peasants, and there needs to be an alliance in that situation. And in many countries of the world, India would be another. Crucially important that the working class articulates and puts forward demands that represent the interests of the peasants, 
so as to form an alliance. That alliance will be led by the working class, not the peasants, not because we are in for privilege and, uh, and think that you know, we worship the working class or a fetish of it. It will be led by the working class because their working class power is concentrated in the workplaces and the cities in a way that peasant power is not, and that will mean that they will be the decisive class in the revolution, but the alliance with the peasants is, uh, is important. Um, the uh, same reason, I think, means that, uh, that what Choi il Bung from uh, Korea was saying is extremely important. The importance of organisation at the workplace. Uh, you know, uh, old Tony Cliff used to say, the power of the working class is in the workplace, uh, 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 and so on. Uh, not the whole truth, but an important part of the truth and organisation of the working uh, well, yes, uh, organisation of the working class in the workplace and in the trade unions is often the absolute cutting edge of the struggle. So, uh, uh, extremely important. Um, it's interesting that the comrade brought up the question of um, Lars Lee. Um, I actually debated with Lars Lee. Well, about, I don't know how long. Ten years ago, eight years ago, I can't remember. In Marxism, here it was interesting when the book first came out. I, the debate was very fraternal and very friendly. And I really welcomed the book. But he wrote a big book about Lenin's What is to be Done, in which he challenged and demolished what I called the, 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 the bourgeois narrative about Lenin. And that was very good. And I said, but there's some things we don't agree on. Interesting, the things we didn't agree on at the time was whether Lenin was really essentially a follower of Kautsky, or there was something fundamentally different between Lenin and Kautsky. And it was interesting how these things... I thought that was a minor argument. He didn't really understand it because he was an academic and didn't understand what it was to be a practising revolutionary. But then you suddenly found all sorts of people said, Lars Lee, wonderful. Lars Lee has proved that you don't need to build an independent revolutionary party, that what you need is a broad party like Kautsky had, with reformists in it and revolutionaries and so on. All sorts of people started seeing that as the basis for the left unity project and all sorts of and abandoning the idea of building a revolutionary party. In other words, they found the weak bit in Lars Lee and made it into the main thing. And Lars Lee has done the same thing. And uh, Gary Jenkins uh, uh, and Kevin Court have, uh, uh, have answered him. But I just want to say that the idea that Lenin was somehow really a Kautskyan and that his disagreements with Kautsky were minor... You can go through it in detail and the historical record, but actually it's there on page two of State and Revolution. <laughs> <coughs> we deal specifically with the one who is chiefly responsible for these distortions, Karl Kautsky, uh, the best-known leader of the Second International, which has met with such miserable bankruptcy, uh, <laughs> etc. Et and if you read the rest of State and Revolution... You find that he, and he says, you know, I now hate Kautsky more than anybody, and Rosa Luxemburg was always right about Kautsky. He said he didn't realise how bad Kautsky was, but anyway. So, so um, uh, uh, that, and uh, I'm going to be told to shut up. So I agree with almost everything people were saying um, uh, 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 about leadership and party class and so on. I just, I'll just say this: um, Greece, right? Uh, obviously, all our minds are on Greece. So the, the, that's interesting. Do people remember when, just a little while ago, Antasia were absolutely denounced on the left because they stood candidates in the election? Uh, 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 again, independent of Syriza. Now, there is a problem with electoral politics. I said that, you know, you can quote Palancis, you can quote Gramsci, you can quote Foucault, you can quote... In the end, a lot of this comes down to the old arguments about a parliamentary road to socialism and electoralism. What we're told is everything has to be subordinated to the left winning. The left. Not the working class winning, the left winning. The left then constitutes the main reformist party. And the demand is always put to revolutionaries, subordinate yourselves to these people. Never mind about that. The main thing is, and so on, you could get it in... The main thing, main thing is to get Jeremy Corbyn elected. I, I'm absolutely in favour of getting Jeremy Corbyn. It's, well, that's, that's great, of course. But is it the main historical task to get Jeremy Corbyn to win the leader of the Labour Party? Is the main thing to get a Labour government in Britain? Haven't we had seven or eight of those already? You know, no. What we are about is not... OK, what we are about 
is not just winning a left majority. You winning a left government does not change society. It's just one step forward in the battle. You elect Syriza, but you still got to win the battle and the war. Right? And the trouble, the problem is, and this, you know, Trotsky called it uh, the wisdom of Hegel and the prophets. Right? To win the war, you need a revolutionary party. To win an election, you need a broad social democrat, you can win an election. But to win the war and for victory for our class, right, and to abolish capitalism, which is what is necessary for the future of humanity, that unfortunately, or fortunately, unfortunately, it's a pain in the ass, but unfortunately, <laughs> you need a revolutionary party, uh, and, that, uh, and, that, uh, and that is what is to be done, to quote Benny. Thank you.